there is not a human being on the planet that does not have unconscious biases. That makes people more open to it. Hi everyone, uh, we're joined today by Jen McCartney from PayPal. Jen is Director of Diversity, Inclusion, Equity and Belonging at PayPal. She was previously PayPal's Director of Talent and Leadership Development and has held a number of positions at the company in uh, a, a career spanning years since 2005, I think. Um, Jen has broad experience across the learning, leadership, coaching spaces. She's chaired one Eventive event already this year and will be joining us again in November in Utrecht. Um, are speaking on the topic of how to unpack unconscious bias in leadership practices. And it's that very topic that brings her here today as well. So we're looking forward to discussing that. Jen, thank you for joining us. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Great to speak to you. So um, diving straight into, into the topic of, of unconscious bias, which is something we see coming up a lot, particularly on our on our executive development and, and leadership development conversations that we that we host with Iventive. Um, how would you define unconscious bias and what do you see as the role of talent and leadership development professionals in addressing it? It's a big question, Richard, you know, and, and it's not one with a very simple answer. Um, it's not easy to define. I think the best way to position it is really to look at the physiological aspect of it. And really, you know, the human brain is amazing. It can process 11 bits of information in a given second, but we can only consciously digest about 40 to 50 items in a second. And that means that we're more than 99% unconscious. And so to process all of this information, our brain has to take cognitive shortcuts and the shortcuts are essential for us to function, but they help us to organize and interpret information as quickly as possible. So they're really critical for us to survive. But the downside is that they can be wrong, especially on matters that need rational thinking. And that's what leads to biases. Um, and I think the one thing that a lot of organizations miss out on is how these unconscious biases interact with each other, too. You know, I've seen a lot of training where we're great at defining what is confirmation bias or the halo effect or affinity bias. But as I said, we're, we're great at defining them separately, but there's never a case where there's just a singular unconscious bias in play at a given time. You know, they interact and reinforce each other in complex ways. So if I meet somebody and there's a similarity or an affinity bias there, that might lead to a halo effect. And then I only look, you know, using confirmation bias for views that reinforce what I already believe. Uh, and so unpacking what unconscious bias is, is really difficult. Um, but I think leadership development plays a really critical role in addressing unconscious biases. You know, leaders are often in the position of influence and decision making. So their understanding of and their commitment to addressing these biases often have a significant impact on the entire culture of the organization and all of its efforts to to really promote diversity and inclusion, equity and belonging. Um, and so it contributes in, in many ways. It's something I could probably talk about for hours, but I think the key things is really making leaders uh, really aware of their own biases and how it's impacting their team. We really need them to be role modeling, you know, to be mitigating for biases and really driving that inclusive environment. And I think the other key thing is um, in relation to measuring progress, I think L&D can really lean in there. Uh, leadership development can kind of emphasize the importance of data collection and measurement to track progress in addressing unconscious biases. And, you know, you can equip leaders to learn how to use metrics and feedback to continually improve diversity and inclusion efforts. So it's it's not easy. And if it was easy, it would be a one and done, right? There's no magic wand here. Mm. It has to be continual um, and constantly reinforced. But I think that's kind of briefly how I would define it and how L&D can, and just some of the things L&D can do to support an organization in that space. Yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. And in the putting the emphasis on the leadership level as well there'll be a lot of people who get into leadership positions who may have carried those unconscious biases with them for for quite some time that must really add to the to the challenge when you're talking about it, senior it, people it does but i think if you start with the 
the playing field that there is not a human being on the planet that does not have unconscious biases that makes people more open to it. It's not something that's being targeted at you directly or you're being told that you're wrong because you have this. I think when you recognize that everybody on the planet has unconscious biases because we are more than 99% unconscious, people just become much more open then to learning about it, how it's impacting them individually and then the effect that they might be having then on others. So it's a, a very open way to, to discuss it. And I think in doing it in that way, people are much more open to the conversation. Yeah, and I guess the, the fact that some of those meant those processes you're talking about help you know they, they they help you if you're making assumptions to make quick decisions and a lot of it in the sort of thinking fast and slow kind of way that um if you're if you're making those assumptions they're helping you make quick decisions but there are going to be times when they're when they're not helping. like we we need them you know we don't think about walking or driving or or those things right we don't think about one foot another foot you know that's all those unconscious processes and i think the example that i give to people is if ever somebody kind of throws a ball at you that you don't see coming, you know, and you just manage to do an amazing catch. You know, that's all of those unconscious processes. So we truly do need them. We couldn't function as human beings without these processes. It just so happens that we have a, there's a downside in that it develops, it causes the development of these unconscious biases in regards to people. Yeah, yeah. So at, at PayPal, how have you gone about addressing this subject? What, what, sort, of, what sort of initiatives are you pursuing? It's it's a journey, Richard. You know, the, as I said, there's no one and done. Um, I think in many ways it has to be both a top down and a bottom up approach. I think from the bottom up perspective, it's about awareness, right? It, it's never judgmental. It's about helping people to recognize, as I said, that every human being on the planet has unconscious biases. And then they're based on, you know, your individual background, your cultural environment, your personal experiences. But if you can help people to recognize their own unconscious biases, it's a great first step. And so we use tools like Harvard's implicit bias test. They can be particularly useful because they can help people to identify what at least some of their own biases might be and that type of focus can make them aware of different situations that their own biases might show up and mitigate for them and it'll also help them to kind of have conversations with their team to know that they're you know the team will know then that they're taking it seriously and they can be a bit more vulnerable with their team in which case their team is going to be more vulnerable than them I think from the top down perspective, though, in many ways, it can be about the data. The data doesn't lie. You know, so I think if you can make each department or each business unit aware of their DNI data, that can help them to identify maybe where there are opportunities in their team and maybe where bias may have crept in at a systemic level. Um, and you need that support from a leadership perspective, you know, as well to continually reinforce the concept and to keep it present and alive because there is no magic wand. There has to be a constant focus on the topic. And so in PayPal, you know, we provide a lot of digital learning or e-learnings on the topic, but we also provide all of our managers with supplementary talking points that they can reinforce in different team meetings after their team have maybe kind of taken some of these e-learnings. And we're always looking out for tools that we can use. You know, we're exploring one at the moment that can help you to um, assess and create more inclusive job specs, for example. And that's just one, one of many. Um, so it's really, you know, as I said, it's both as a top down and a bottom up approach um, and one won't work without the other. You know, you need to have that constant reinforcement. But you also need to have it as a constant topic of dialogue within your organization, because if it's not constant, people will forget. Right. And they'll just go back to their normal way of operating. Um, and so it needs to be constant and continuous, mm. but somebody needs to be keeping an eye on the data as well, because the data will more often than not show you where the opportunities are. I don't know if that helps. 
Yeah, definitely. And it's it's that that follow up and that monitoring seems like it's it's going to be so important because this is the kind of thing that can so easily go in a slide deck, um, get emailed around, and you, you know, everyone washes their hands of it. And and it lands wrong, right? It doesn't land in the right way. So if you're going to get a scorecard saying, okay, you know, you're gender diversity is low or your racial diversity is low our inclination can be okay I just need to kind of go and hire people to fit this to fix the issue but that's just transactional it's really by becoming aware of your biases and seeing how they may impact you in the interviewing or the hiring process or indeed even in your ongoing team management you know, I, I often talk to people about the people that they trust the most. And when you do activities with them, you can see that affinity bias more than anything feeds into the people that you trust the most. And then as a manager, when you think about I have a high visibility project or that will give you exposure to senior leadership, who am I most likely to give that to? Well, it's probably somebody that I trust. And therefore, it's probably somebody who's got a lot of affinity with me. And what I'm actually doing is replicating myself within an organization rather than giving diversity an opportunity to thrive. So I think when you can make managers and leaders aware of those types of things, you really see those light bulb moments um, happening. But you can see change then happening for the right reasons rather than just to massage a scorecard so that your piece of paper looks good. So it's both. Yeah, yeah. And and you, you touched on the challenges that individual leaders and managers face when they're um when when they're tackling this shit this issue. Um I said how how willing have you found the the individual leaders and managers that you've worked with? Um, how willing have you found them to be when when you bring this topic to them? Um, and what sort of challenges do they have to overcome to identify what their unconscious biases might be? Uh, yeah, Richard, it's a difficult one. You know, I think the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Um, but once you even see the title, you know, of diversity and inclusion training or unconscious bias training, people automatically get defensive, right? They they can take it quite personally. So I think it depends on how on how it's really framed. When we understand that it's part of the human condition, you know, people become much more open to it. Um, and identifying the unconscious biases themselves isn't hard or it's not that hard, um, but actioning it on a day to day basis is, is, is harder. And I think the other thing that's really important for some organizations, particularly global organizations that we need to be aware of is it's not a case of one fits all culture sits very closely on top of diversity and inclusion. And in global organizations, a lot of the time what happens is the strategies and the ideas are born out of the US and then they're nearly just thrown across the fence to APAC and to EMEA to deploy as is. And it doesn't work because the culture of each country and each region is very different and how we expect women to show up or marginalized communities to show up in different countries is very different because of those cultural nuances. So I think any of those strategies really need to be localized for the organization as well. Because if you're sitting in Ireland or the UK, for example, and you get something that's very Americanized, it's not gonna resonate with you. And so you're not going to take it as seriously. The examples that are given really need to be very relevant to your, you know, your environment and your ecosphere, which will make you much more open to it. So that localization is really important as well. Yeah, and the distances don't even have to be as great as the US to the UK, do they? I mean, even you you, you mentioned UK and Ireland. There, there's going to be there's different cultural contexts even over that, that relative. That's, and like even within Ireland, you know, this tiny little country, uh, religion is a massive area. Uh, and so, you know, you can look at all of this thing, these things as it's an opportunity or, or it's a likelihood for conflict, but you can also look at it as, a, as an opportunity for diversity of thought and greater innovation and an opportunity to learn from each other as well. So mm. really, again, it depends on how it's framed, but when it's framed as everybody has a place here and everybody's thoughts are, are welcome and invited um over time it certainly becomes easier and it just becomes part of the dna 
of the organization. But in order to do that, as new people are joining the organization, they need to be seeing it and hearing it from day one. You know, it can't just be a piece of paper on the wall or something that's mentioned once. It needs to be continually discussed and reinforced at every opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And so it sounds like you've done done some great work and and um, made a lot of made a lot of progress. But what what advice would you give to others who are maybe there near the beginning of this journey? They're thinking, right, this sounds great. What do I actually do to to get started? Um, and as part of that, I guess, what what would you do differently if you were starting again? today it's it's again it's a, it's, a, it's a big question Richard. <laughs> I think the first thing I'd say to people is not to lose heart you know I think when you start doing this work you become aware of all of the issues rather than the solutions very easily and you'll have a couple of interactions that are quite depressing quite honestly you know mm. and really can make you want to to give up but you'll find some people that are just amazing and that they will help you to persevere I think um, generally speaking, as I said earlier, you know, if they're trying to think about how do I tackle this at an organizational level, it has to be that two pronged approach, right? That bottom up and the top down. I would always advise people to start with the data that will generally show you where many of the opportunities are, you know, and ultimately, and I, it, this is not my expression, but if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Mm -hmm. Um, ERGs are fantastic. I think having a large focus on allyship can be really important. But I think another piece of advice I'd give to people is looking at um, how do you recognize people's allyship and ERG efforts as part of performance reviews, right? Because um, we put into our performance reviews the things that are critical to the organization. So having it as part of your performance reviews really reinforces that this is part of the culture of the organization. And of course, it should be part of your organization's mission, vision, and values as well. Uh, another great thing to do is to support managers and how to have interventions, you know, when they see microaggressions and exclusion happening, right? What do I do in those instances? You know, how do I build that muscle so that I'm confident to intervene myself? And if and when should I be getting HR involved? And as I mentioned earlier, it really needs to be infused in, in training from day one of a new person starting in an organization. And then I think it's about giving leaders strategies. You know, uh, what can I practically do on a day to day basis? And there's so many different things. You know, some of the things I tell people are, you know, take note of the onlys. You know, if you're in a situation or in an environment, you know, who's the only woman there, the only man in the team, the only LGBTQ person, the only interracial individual, you know, they're more likely to need support potentially on a day to day basis. You know, if there's a quiet person in your meeting, asking them and inviting them into the conversation by asking, what do you think? You know, and, and getting to know people, you know, asking personal open ended questions to get to know people and to get to know each other better. I think if I was to go back in time myself and what I would do differently, you know, again, it's, it's a hard question to answer because the work is never done. I think the advice I'd give to anybody is to start with yourself, right? To be aware of your own biases um, know that you bring them into this work with you know that you can't push your views onto other people all you can really do is to provide a psychologically safe environment for people to discuss and create awareness and i think when you're authentic and vulnerable about your own biases people are more likely to be open about their own and i think the biggest learning that i i've had coming from a training background you know i think we think that we can kind of train on anything and I, that was certainly a wake up call for me that, no, you can't. So it's harder to see the issues when you're not part of that marginalized group or that outsider group. Um, and having as many conversations with people who are different from you and their experience in the workplace and beyond can be incredibly informative. 
And if you're going into those conversations, you know, it's important to go into them, not trying to solve the problem because, you know, you can't solve the problem of, you know, your gender or your race or your sexual orientation, but you can listen. And, you know, and in that listening, you can really learn what are some of the opportunities to provide greater support to this group. Um, and I so I think that would probably that's a long answer, <laughs> uh, Richard, to what seems like quite a straightforward question, but it's not a straightforward question. No, absolutely. And um, and no, thank you for, for for going into so much detail and for for sharing all those those experiences. What I'm what, what was going through my mind as you were speaking was that it's you know, it, it's as much about diversity of thought as it is about diversity of of, of background and 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 people and that you need you need to have that diversity of thought in how you design the process and the the systems for tackling unconscious bias as much as anything else you know and if you think about any company um your customer base is always going to be the most diverse part of any company and we sometimes forget that so in order to serve a diverse community we need a diverse population and the like when the questions i'm asked a lot is like so what you know why mm -hmm. can't we just come in and do our jobs right and just kind of get on with it um, but, you know, having a diverse workforce, I can't remember off the top of my head where this statistic came from, but having a diverse workforce alone will generally give you a lift of about seven to 10 percent across all of your KPIs, all key performance indicators. Just diversity alone is going to give you about a seven to 10 percent lift. Inclusion is where the difference really happens, though. You know, you can have as diverse a workforce as you like, but if not everybody has got that opportunity to share their voice and their ideas, you're not going to get the inclusion lift that's needed. And when you truly have a workforce where everybody's viewpoint is included, you're looking at a 14 to 20 percent lift across all of your KPIs. So that is the answer to the question of so what? But beyond the organizational perspective, you know, having an environment where you feel that your voice is valued and your ideas are valued, you're just much more likely to give your ideas and to give your suggestions within that organization and to feel valued, which increases the likelihood of you actually staying in that organization and feeling like you belong there and that you have a valued voice there. And so as well as all of that KPI lift, you're also massively reducing um, your attrition, you know, your retention starts to really increase as well. And I think everybody's heard that statistic about we don't leave companies, we leave leaders, mm. right? And, and that's why it's so important for our leaders at every level of an organization to be creating that inclusive environment where everybody's viewpoint is listened to, even if it's not relevant now, the impact that that has on an individual basis is, is really critical as well. And that's again, the top down versus the bottom up. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's, that, that, that's a, um, an impactful note to, uh, to, to end on. Um, thank you so much for, for, for sharing your views and your, your, your experiences um, on that. I'm sure lots of people uh, watching and listening will have um, a lot of new and uh, exciting ideas to, to take away. Um, so, Thank you again for, for, for joining us, Jen. Really great to, to, to have you on. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon at an eventive event. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks so much, Richard.